May 8, 1945, Germany surrenders, and across a hundred airfields from Denmark to Austria, American and British troops push open hangar doors to discover something they never expected. Thousands of aircraft just sitting there. Messerschmitt 262 jets with revolutionary engines still warm, Fokker Wolf 190 fighters in factory fresh condition, fuel in their tanks, Junkers 88 bombers lined up like they're waiting for orders that will never come. The entire surviving fleet of Hitler's Luftwaffe abandoned mid mission. But here's what those Allied soldiers climbing into those cockpits didn't know. They were standing at the starting line of the most insane treasure hunt in aviation history. A race between superpowers that would involve secret midnight flights, underground factories, and some of the most advanced aircraft ever built, meeting the most bizarre fates you can imagine. This is what really happened to the Luftwaffe after World War II. By May 1945, the Luftwaffe was shattered. Four years of war had destroyed 76,875 German aircraft, 43,000 lost in combat, the rest in crashes and training accidents, but thousands more remained intact. At Leckfeld Airfield near Augsburg, nine flyable Messerschmitt 262 jets sat on the runway. Across Denmark and Norway, hundreds more fighters waited. In Czechoslovakia, entire warehouses held complete airframes and spare parts, fresh from factories that had been producing aircraft until literally the final hours. The scale was staggering. Hidden in forests, tucked into underground bunkers, scattered across occupied Europe. But this wasn't 1918. This wasn't a pile of obsolete biplanes heading for the scrapyard. These were Time's Jet's asterisk. Rocket-powered interceptors. Night fighters with radar technology years ahead of anything the Allies had. And every major power wanted them. Immediately. In Washington, Pentagon officials were facing an uncomfortable truth. They'd underestimated German aviation technology by times, years, asterisk. The Messerschmitt 262 had been operational since 1944, hitting speeds over 540 miles per hour. The Arado 234 jet bomber could reach altitudes no Allied fighter could touch. These weren't experimental prototypes. These were production aircraft that had seen combat, and the Soviets were loading them onto eastbound trains right now. On April 22, 1945, Two weeks before Germany even surrendered, the U.S. Army Air Forces launched Operation Lusty, Luftwaffe secret technology. The mission, find every advanced German aircraft still intact, secure them before Soviet forces arrive, get them to American territory, ship them to the United States, do it while competing with 32 other Allied intelligence groups, all hunting the same prizes. Leading the operation was Colonel Harold Watson, a test pilot from Wright Field. He handpicked a team capable of flying anything with wings. They called themselves Watson's Wizards. The Wizards moved fast. At Lechfeld, they found those nine Messerschmitt II 62s. But there was one problem none of them had ever flown a jet. The solution came from an unexpected source. On May 8th, a Luftwaffe pilot named Hauptmann Heinz Brohr landed at Munich after evacuating 70 women, children, and wounded troops. As he climbed from his cockpit, an American officer approached with an offer, prison camp, or join the Wizards and keep flying. Brohr chose to fly. He was joined by Karl Bauer, Messerschmitt's chief test pilot, along with Ludwig Hoffmann and Gerhard Kulis. These men knew every quirk of the 262, every dangerous tendency of its engines. They became the Americans' flight instructors. On June 10, 1945, the first ME 262s lifted off from Leckfeld with American pilots at the controls and former Luftwaffe test pilots riding alongside. They flew to France, the first leg of a journey that would take them across the Atlantic. But the Wizards were finding more than just jets. 
They located the Arado 234, the world's first operational jet bomber. The Dornier 335, a bizarre push-pull fighter with engines in both the nose and tail. Heinkel 162 Volksjägers, wooden jets built by slave labor in underground factories. Even early helicopters, the competition was fierce. British teams were running their own operation. French intelligence wanted technology to rebuild their aviation industry. And the Soviets? Anything in their path was vanishing east. At one facility, American teams literally raced to photograph thousands of pages of research documents before the British showed up to claim it. By July 1945, the Wizards had assembled something unprecedented at Cherbourg, France. Forty German aircraft. The crown jewels of Luftwaffe technology. Ten Messerschmitt 262s. Multiple Arado 234 bombers. Heinkel 219 night fighters. The Fokker Wolf Ta 152. The high altitude interceptor that had terrorized Allied bomber crews. But how do you get 40 captured enemy aircraft across the Atlantic? The answer, HMS Reaper, a British escort carrier on loan from the U.S. Navy. On July 19, 1945, Reaper departed Cherbourg Harbor, carrying the only surviving examples of some of the most advanced aircraft ever built. Think about this. A British escort carrier, built in America, crewed by Royal Navy sailors, carrying captured German aircraft for American evaluation. It was like something out of a spy novel. Nine days later, Reaper docked in Newark, New Jersey. That single voyage preserved aviation history that would otherwise have been lost forever. While Americans celebrated their intelligence coup, the Soviets were running their own operation in the East. On August 15, 1945, Soviet test pilot Andrei Kochetkov made the first Soviet test flight of a captured ME-262. Soviet forces had claimed at least 20 Junkers Jumo engines, 15 BMW engines, complete blueprints, and production tooling. By December, Soviet aerospace leaders were debating what to do with it all. Some wanted to immediately restart production and put German jets into Soviet service. Others warned this would be a dead end once the designs became obsolete. The Soviets took a middle path. They wouldn't copy German aircraft directly, but they'd use German engines, German manufacturing, and German engineers to leapfrog their own programs. The MiG and Sukhoi design bureaus would build around captured German engines. German engineers, some voluntarily, others under duress, found themselves working in Soviet facilities, passing on knowledge that would help create the next generation of MiGs. But for the vast majority of Luftwaffe aircraft, a different fate awaited. The Allied Control Commission made a decision. The Luftwaffe would be erased, not just disbanded, but physically eliminated from existence. Air disarmament squadrons fanned out across occupied Germany. Their mission was brutally simple. Inventory every aircraft, strip anything usable, then destroy the rest. The scenes were surreal. At Flensburg Airfield, Royal Air Force teams supervised German prisoners as they dismantled Fokker Wolf fighters row by row. Cattle grazed among hundreds of Junkers, 88 bombers. Sheep wandered through fields of abandoned aircraft. German prisoners used acetylene torches to cut apart the same aircraft they'd maintained weeks earlier. American soldiers stood watch as Messerschmitt 262 jets were reduced to scrap metal. Their revolutionary engines extracted for study. Their airframes destroyed on the spot. At some sites, the volume made cutting impractical. Aircraft were simply bulldozed into massive piles and burned. According to official records, over one million tons of material was scrapped. The work was as much symbolic as strategic. The Allies wanted Germany to see the totality of defeat. By late 1946, it was done. Airfields that once hosted the most advanced air force in the world now sat empty, the smell of cut metal hanging in the air. 
But not every Luftwaffe aircraft met the torch. In Czechoslovakia, something remarkable was happening. When German forces occupied Czechoslovakia in 1939, they'd converted the country's aviation industry to produce German aircraft. Factories in Prague had built Messerschmitt 262s right up until the war's end. When liberation came, those factories still held complete airframes, thousands of parts. At Jatek Airfield, engineers from Avia discovered stocks of ME-262 parts and Jumo engines. They began assembling aircraft from these components. On August 27, 1946, over a year after the war ended, the first rebuilt ME-262 lifted off with a Czechoslovak pilot at the controls. It received a new designation, Avia S-92. This is insane when you think about it. While the Western Allies were scrapping or studying German jets, and the Soviets were using them to inform new designs, Czechoslovakia was actually times flying them operationally asterisk. For a brief period, Avia S-92s served as frontline fighters in the Czechoslovak Air Force, the only nation to operate German jets after the war. The program ended in 1950 when Soviet pressure forced Czechoslovakia to adopt Soviet aircraft. The remaining S-92s were grounded and Czechoslovakia's brief jet age came to an end. Back in the United States, the captured aircraft were revealing their secrets. At Freeman Field in Indiana, American test pilots pushed the ME-262s to their limits. The jets were impressive but temperamental. The engines were prone to flameouts. Throttle control required a delicate touch, but the speed was intoxicating. 540 miles per hour, faster than any American fighter in production. The Arado 234 revealed even more startling capabilities. At high altitude, it could outrun American interceptors. Its reconnaissance variant could photograph targets with near impunity. German swept-wing research revolutionized American thinking about high-speed flight. Lessons from German engine design informed American turbojet development for years. But by 1950, when the Korean War broke out, Freeman Field needed its storage buildings. The captured aircraft were moved outside, exposed to the elements. By 1953, many were deteriorating badly. Some were transferred to museums. The rest were scrapped. The irony was brutal. Aircraft that survived the most devastating air war in history, that crossed the Atlantic in an escort carrier, that revealed billions in research secrets, were now being crushed and buried as the Cold War heated up. It's believed captured examples of the Junkers 290 and Heinkel 177, massive four-engine aircraft that could have taught researchers volumes, were crushed flat and buried under what is now O'Hare International Airport, but a handful survived. Today, the National Museum of the United States Air Force houses one of the ME. 262s, brought back by Operation Lusty, named Screaming Mimi for the howl of its jet engines. It hangs in the World War II gallery, still wearing German markings. The Smithsonian displays the only surviving Arado 234, the sole example to escape destruction. At the Udvar Hazy Center near Washington, visitors can see one of the Dornier 335s from HMS Reaper, its unusual push-pull configuration still drawing amazed stares 80 years later. The story of what happened to the Luftwaffe after World War II is a story of competing priorities. American intelligence teams racing against time to capture technology that would shape the jet age. Soviet engineers extracting knowledge to power their aviation industry. Czechoslovak mechanics assembling jets from spare parts. Allied soldiers systematically destroying hundreds of thousands of tons of aircraft to ensure Germany could never rise again. From the moment that first American soldier pushed open a hangar door in May 1945 and saw rows of abandoned aircraft, to the day HMS Reaper docked in Newark, to the present when visitors stand beneath a Messerschmitt 262 in the Smithsonian, 
The fate of the Luftwaffe tells the story of one of history's great technological transitions, the end of propeller-driven warfare, the beginning of the jet age, the start of the Cold War. Those machines, built by German engineers who never imagined their creations, would end up in American museums or Czechoslovak squadrons or Soviet testing facilities, became more than just aircraft. They became artifacts of a vanished air force, symbols of a lost war, and teachers whose lessons would echo through aviation history for generations. If you want more untold stories from World War II, hit that subscribe button. Trust me, you won't want to miss what's coming next.